All right, so uh, today we are going to talk about system diagrams. Uh, this will be the first of a few different bits of paperwork that we'll learn about. Um, hopefully you've started to see some of this paperwork um, that's been done for the shows. Uh, so in particular today I'm going to take you through the, the system diagram and I'll give you a little assignment to diagram something. Uh, you've all been taking cattle here, so um, I, I, I'm assuming you sort of know your way around that. So this is really just showing you what our drawings really look like. Um, and then how to CAD that is, is something that, I, that you can figure out on your own. I'll show you a little bit today. But um, the there are actually not a whole lot of standards out there for the kinds of drawings we do. Uh, I participated in uh, a little small working group through, through USITT uh, a few years ago. Um, well, more than a few years ago. It was now 2007 that we started. I guess that was a while ago now. Um, and our effort was to try to start building some guidelines for this. And it, we didn't tackle everything. We primarily just looked at system diagrams uh, in an attempt to provide some. It's, we, 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 can't, we fell just short of calling it a standard because we didn't want to necessarily attempt to enforce the use of this. But um, we did want to provide this as a guideline for people who are trying to learn how to do things. Um, so. You can get this document uh, on the USITT website if you want to. You go to usitt.org and go to Commissions, and then you go to the Sound Design and Technology uh, Commission, and then there's a link here for the Sound Graphics Project. And uh, there's some links here that for the actual guidelines along with some systems examples. Most of them are ones that I've uploaded for them. Um, but this is the basic document, and I encourage you to go through and read all of this. There's some important things in here about how it's supposed to work. Um, but the basic idea behind a system diagram is, and this is an important thing for you to wrap your head around, is that you're not drawing a picture of a sound system. Okay, You're drawing a diagram of signal flow. So what you draw does not need to look like the sound system. It does not need to look like the actual equipment. It does not need to be to look like the way it actually connects up. It's about the way that things that sound and signal flow from one thing to another, how things connect from one thing to another. Um, the physical cabling infrastructure may be slightly different than what is on your diagram, and that's okay. Uh, so. With that in mind, uh, when we set out to make these the, these guidelines, we really shied away as much as possible from things that looked like the thing that you were trying to draw. So we started out with this, um, what we'd call the debate, the basic device block, and that's what you're seeing over here. Uh, and this can really represent any kind of equipment. So any kind of sound equipment is going to have inputs and outputs, maybe just one or the other, um, but certainly at least one or one or both of those. Uh, and you know, you should, it should have like a make and a model and some sort of category. And so, you, you know, equipment type, you would put, you know, like a CD player or a mixing console or, you know, whatever. Uh, and if you wanted to put the actual make and model over the top, you could. And thus the, Paradigm here is that sound, the signal flows from left to right. So it's coming in to the left of the device and going out to the right. So as you look at the signal flow of your diagram, it should start with the things that make the sound on the left side of the page. And then that sound travels from left to right as it makes its way through the sound system until it comes out the other end of the loudspeakers. Um, and that's, that's really... Uh, serves as the, the basis for this whole thing, is this notion that we just have this device block. This does not look like any particular piece of equipment. We're not trying to draw little pictograms of um, CD players and mixing consoles with little knobs on it and things like that. Um, that's just not useful. It it's wastes a ton of time. It doesn't tell you anything useful. Uh, there, in, in order to kind of make this thing easier to read, you might end up needing to show a particular device in more than one place on your diagram. So rather than try to make a whole bunch of like spaghetti, trying to draw lines from one thing to another and crossing over things, sometimes it might be easier to just show something twice. 
Uh, and if you do have to show something twice, uh, this little break line at the bottom of the device indicates that this particular device is going to appear more than once on the drawing. And it's not meant to be interpreted as two different things. It's meant to represent the same thing. And if you have a complicated enough drawing, it might span several pages, and in which case you may want to put a little note underneath of here saying, you know, this shows up again on plate three or whatever. Uh, that way when we see it again, we know it's the same thing. Uh, so you basically then just kind of link things together. So here we have a mic preamp going and a CD recorder, and we just connect lines from the outputs to the inputs. And that serves as the basis for pretty much the entire diagram. Uh, anything that is audio signal would go from the left to the right. If it's any sort of control data um, or control port, that would connect at the bottom here. Um, and that's this example of, of like an Ethernet connection to remote control that preamp uh, would come out of the bottom because it's not audio. Uh, it's just a you know, it's how you would remote control it. So you would indicate that just by which direction it's coming out of the box from. Uh, so you could really do a whole diagram just like this with little, with little device blocks with names of the equipment on it and you connect it all up together. Uh, there are some things you could do to make things a little bit more specific. For example, uh, if this was the only drawing you were going to do, you may want to indicate connection types, you know, whether it's XLR or a quarter inch tippering sleeve, that kind of stuff. Um, generally on the drawings we do here, we don't do that because we are also generating patch plots and other drawings that give us that information. So in order to try to keep the system diagrams simple to read, we tend not to include that kind of information, but you could if you needed to. Um, another convention we sort of came up with in order to simplify things was uh, and this is actually, this particular idea is not new. I mean, we didn't really come up with it. This, this is used in some other drawing standards and things too, where instead, let's say you've got, um, for example, a whole bunch of wireless mics or something. Uh, and, you know, they're just going to be connecting in a sequence starting at input 9 and going to input 32. And that's 24 total mics. Rather than drawing 24 total lines, you could draw two lines that fan out. Um, I think that that can help you in some ways, but it can hurt you too. You gotta be really careful with that. I don't actually recommend using that very often because sometimes it can lead to confusion about what thing actually connects to which input. Uh, you're, you're inferring some things here that you may not want to infer. And I would always err on the side of clarity here. So if you have the room just to actually draw each individual line, I would go ahead and do that. If for some reason you need to free up some space on the page to make room for other things, then this might be a strategy where you could do that. But I would be very careful about that, and I wouldn't I certainly wouldn't jump to that immediately. Uh, make every effort to, to not have to do this. But this is available as an option. Uh, patch bays uh, end up looking a little bit different because patch bay is technically not a device. It's not a piece of equipment. Uh, a patch bay is really just a bunch of connectors that are sitting in a box. I mean, the patch bay doesn't have any power, so there's, no, there's nothing really going on there. It's just a bunch of connectors and wire. And so we draw those a little bit differently. They're, they're about half as wide as a standard device block. And uh, they don't get the sort of title bar on them. They just get a label. And then you sort of show on the left side connections and then the right side connections. And then you draw little lines in between them to show things that would connect up together. So you would really put labels on the, on the ends of each of these. So the little carrots here represent the connector on the patch panel. And this would be, you know, like your mic one wall plate or something. And then over here would be the cable that connects up to your mixing console input number or whatever. And then you can draw a line in between them to say, I'm going to put a patch cable between those two. And remember, this is a diagram of signal flow, not a picture of a patch bay. So things do not have to be in the order that they actually are on the patch bay. The point is that this thing connects to that thing, not that it's in a particular order. So, you know, you could actually arrange this stuff in any order you want. Uh, you, know, you could say, you know, two, five, eight, one, 
so on and so forth. It doesn't have to be in any particular order. Uh, because if you're going to use this to actually patch the system, you're not going to care what order it's in. You're just going to say, look, all right, first patch is going from this connection to this connection. You just find this one and then find that one and make the connection. Uh, then you go on to the next one. And you know, whether they're in the order they are on the thing is not going to really matter. Okay. So again, err on the side of clarity in making the drawing really easy to read. Don't get too focused on trying to make it lay out the way it really lays out in real life. That's not as critical. Okay. Uh, and you can use the same conventions with the fan out. Now notice that there are two different conventions here. We have this one that fans out with a curvy line and this one that fans out with, a, with right angles. So the curvy line actually means that this is a snake. Uh, so in other words, all these lines really tie together in one bundle, one snake, and then fan back out of the connection. If it's right angles like that, then that actually means these are separate cables. These are separate lines that don't actually bundle together. They're just being bundled together for purposes of the drawing. But then again, I don't, you know, I would not really recommend using this unless absolutely necessary to free up some space. But note, but just note that having, uh, you know, the curved line that, or versus a right angle, that communicates something different in this standard. Uh, there's also something you can use uh, if something in your drawing is going to exist in an unusual location. Uh, you know, some, some place where you wouldn't expect it. Uh, you can draw a little dat dotted box around it and say this is where this will be located. For example, um, traditionally all of your amplifiers would be in the amp room. But if for some reason you have an amplifier that is not going to be found in the amp room, it's going to be off stage left or something, you may want to indicate that in your drawing that you know this thing is going to be somewhere else, and so you you could indicate that with that box. Um, I've seen people get really carried away with those boxes and put boxes around everything to tell you where everything is. And that's really not the point. The point is to use that to highlight something that is an exception to the norm. Uh, so if if you're doing something that would be unexpected, then you would want to use that box to indicate that so that people understand where that thing's going and what's, what it's being used for. As I said, in some cases you may need to uh, break out to more than one page and if that has to happen at a connection you, you might use something like this where uh, you can have the line going out and then you would have a little number inside of here uh, and you could put a label saying you know, you'll find this on plate whatever and then you would have a similar one on that plate that had the same number that then continued on. So we would know where that picked up. In some cases, uh, generally we like to try to not let lines cross on the page. And so if you find yourself in a situation where you just have to have a line, if, you know, if this line was going to have to go through here and there was no way around having a line also go vertically through it, and you just could not figure out a way to, to around that. Um, and that would be the ideal is to figure out a way around that. But if you had to, you could do this sort of break. You could break the line with these little squigglies on it and then let your other line go through it. Um, as long as the gap was fairly narrow and we could see that what was going on, then that would probably be okay. But if it's, if it's a large gap and there's a lot of things going on between it, it would be unclear. Uh, so the problem with having the two lines intersect is then you have to wonder, well, do those connect? Is that a connection point in the system? Or is that just two lines occupying the same space? I've actually found uh, there's a, and this is a this goes into like electrical schematic standards. That another way of dealing with this is if is if you've got to have a line that draw that goes across here and you want to show that it's not connected, you could really just do a kind of an arch, like a you know a half circle uh, as you go over there to and that, that's usually and visually enough to sort of indicate that there's no connection happening there. So that's an option too. Although we didn't put that in here. Any questions so far? Okay, so with that in mind, if you do need to indicate a connection, uh, you know, two lines crossing on the page, uh, if they cross because they actually touch <laughs> in the system, you've got wires touching, you would use a little dot there to indicate that. So in this case, we essentially have a Y cable here uh, that splits out to, to both of the, the C recorder and the computer interface. Uh, and so notice with this particular line also crosses here and here, but there's no dots, which tells me that they don't actually touch in real life. 
The only splice is happening here where the dot is. And that's fairly clear, I think, um, as, as far as what's going on. Now, the way that that cable actually works is it's probably a connector here and a Y that goes out. But remember, we're not drawing a picture of a sound system. We're drawing a diagram of signal flow. And this is much clearer in, a, in how that's the, the signal is functioning. It's actually tapping into this wire and then going into a second thing. The physical reality will be slightly different, but you know, in that it won't really look like this. You're not going to have a connector right in the middle of your cable. Um, but diagrammatically, this makes more sense. Okay. Uh, you know, if you want, if you're going to use stage boxes, you could treat them like kind of a half patch bay, uh, if you needed to, and you could you could show that and then have connections coming in and out of there. There's another example of a, of a you know, kind of like one of these multi-panels like we have in the patron's theater that has lots of things in it. Um, if, this, if you were going to do, this is probably not particularly useful for a single show drawing, but if you were going to do kind of a, a standard diagram for a space that had a, an existing infrastructure and you wanted to have a diagram that showed all the possible connection points and panels and things, this would probably be useful, uh, being able to draw the panels out. This is how you would do it. All right, amplifiers. So uh, power amplifiers end up looking a little bit different. They're quite a bit narrower than the standard device blocks. Uh, little, you know, about a third the width of a standard device block. And then the little triangles inside, would indi you'd have one triangle for every amplifier channel. So a given amplifier that's in you know, a box would, could have you know, one, two, four, eight different amplifier, actual amplifier channels on it. In most cases, it's going to be two channels. Most of the amplifiers are run into, but you do run into some that are, di that are different. So you would you put a triangle for each actual amplifier channel. So if it's a two-channel amplifier, you have two triangles in it. A triangle is sort of an electrical symbol for amplifier in this context. And you know you would try to have some unique ID for that amp, amp A, B, or one, two, three. Um, then you can write the make and model over the top. And there's different configurations for amplifiers. If you're going to run it in two-channel mode, it would look like this. If you're going to do the parallel mono, which is where you're using one input to drive both channels. Um, so you've got one signal going to two different loudspeakers on two separate amp channels, but they get fed by the same thing. You would draw that here because what's actually happening inside the amp is you're tapping off of that input one and feeding that into number two. So you're, it's like there's a wire splice in there. So you would use the dot there. A bridge mono is where you're going to use both channels to drive a single thing. You get more power that way. Uh, so this is how you would diagram that. You would just connect the two, the tips of the two triangles together and go out to the cable. Uh, let's see. Just, yeah. There's a, up a little bit. There's the um, where it says HFLF. Mm -hmm. There's curved line coming up off of that. Mm -hmm. Does that does that indicate? Yeah. So what's happening here is this is an example where we're doing sort of some sort of active crossover. So this this amp channel is going to is meant to drive the high frequency driver of the loudspeaker, and then this one is meant to drive the low frequency driver. But ultimately, that shows up in a single NL4. It has all four conductors in there. So two of them would be for the high frequency, two would be for the low frequency. And so what we're showing here is that right now this is a, a separate cable. It's right angles. Until here it gets curvy, and that's because it's merging into a single NL4 connector on a patch panel. Okay. So those two lines actually now are inhibiting the same physical space in reality, which is that NL4 connector on the panel. So how would that translate in I mean, would you have a Y cable or something breaking it down into a? No, you would just you would have the you would have the, the outputs of the two amplifiers. You'd have two wires coming from each one, and they would just get soldered into the four contacts on the L4 on the panel. That's it. But when you go to the patch bay, you're going to see a single L4 connection, and based on the diagram here, you'll know that you're actually going to pick up both signals off that one connector. Uh, loudspeakers, you know, there are so many different configurations for loudspeakers. Uh, so the, the basic idea is this sort of symbol. This was the indicates a driver, loudspeaker driver. Um, and then out to the right here, you would put sort of the location or the purpose of it. For example, center cluster or stage left monitor or you know, whatever it is. 
um, and then you can put the make and model there. Uh, if you have the space and you want to give the detail, and we tend to like to do this detail, it's nice to dry, you know, actually draw how many drivers are in there, just so that you know how, you know, how this thing works. Um, so usually we will do that. You don't have to, but it's highly recommended that you do that. Uh, if it's a self-powered loudspeaker, like an Eon or something that we have from our shop that has an amplifier in it, then you need to draw the amplifier triangle inside that loudspeaker box to indicate that it's self-powered. We tend to, in our diagrams, we tend to not draw the power connection because we had to do a separate drawing for power. Uh, so, but if, if you weren't going to do, if you were in a situation where this was the only drawing you were going to do and you wanted to indicate the power, then you could actually diagram power along with this. But we, it tends to be more effective to do that as a separate drawing, I found. If you are going to be bi-amping a loudspeaker uh, with an NL4 connection, this is how you would do it. You would draw a line into each driver of the cabinet and then and then indicate with these arrows that these two things span a single NL4 connector. Okay, So uh, this way you're able to see very clearly which amp connects to which channel, uh, but you're indicating that that's a single connection point that's doing that. Uh, if you're going to daisy chain the amps, like in parallel, uh, you would do that here. You would do a little dot at the input point of the loudspeaker and then drop that down and into the next last speaker. Sort of a through? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, microphones, uh, the symbol for microphone is this little circle with the line on the left side, the left, well, that line representing the diaphragm of the mic, so that would be on the left. And then if you've got a lot of microphones, you may want to give them all unique numbers so you know which is which. Uh, and you have to put the location, make and model, so and so, so forth there. Uh, and then that would connect into whatever it is you're going to do. The little curvy line is, is not used very often. That's just, uh, you can use that to sometimes show cable lengths if that ends up being a bit of detail you want to show here. But again, usually that's not necessary in our diagram. So this normally should be a straight line. If it's a wireless mic, you would have to draw the transmitter and the receiver as separate things. This would be true even if it's a handheld mic. So if it's like a handheld 58 or something, you would still draw it just like this because that's still a microphone connecting to a transmitter. It's just it's all in one thing that you're holding in your hand. Uh, but this looks more like the body pack transmitter with the little lav mic like we were sh showing on Tuesday. Uh, and then the receiver over here. Um, and then, you know, you would, this little symbol is, is just something that you came up with to indicate the wireless signal. And then if you want, you can put the frequency here that it's going to operate on. That's pretty much it. Uh, and then we just included, these are just some kind of standard um, ANSI or IEEE standard uh, symbols for different electrical components, which you might find yourself if you're doing a more complicated control diagram, this might be useful, but you know, you're into that very often. All right, so let me show you some examples here. Here's just a, you know, a very, very small system that I did for a class. Uh, let's see. So we have um, you know, a laptop computer, and the Ethernet is connecting into some other computer, a playback computer. This was, I was using SFX at this point. Uh, so I was indicating an Ethernet connection there, which was a data control, so that was coming out of the bottom. And then the computer had a connection for the sound card, which was also data, and that went into here. Now, this is, at this point, we're making sound. So from here, um, you know, we have outputs 1 through 8, or 1 through 6. And those go into amplifiers, which then go into loudspeakers. So this was an effort to just show, using the standard blocks without any modification, how you might do a drawing. In reality, I would want to spread these out. You know, I, I would want to go ahead and modify this block, lengthen it so it was the full height of this whole thing. Then I don't have to do all these dog leg lines. Um, same thing here. I would spread out these amps a little bit so that I wouldn't have to dog leg those lines. But you know, spread the whole thing out. Um, so that anytime you've got, anytime you find yourself having to do these angles on the lines, see if there's some way you can spread something else. You don't have to do that because it makes it more difficult to read the diagram if you've got a more complicated one. In this case, it's easy, but in a more complicated one, it'd be very difficult. For example, here is a more much, much, much more complicated one. 
Okay, this is one from a show we did uh, here called Sending the Purple with George. Much more complicated drawing. There's a lot more going on here. And notice that very rarely do we end up with, you know, lines that are dog like like that. You know, she ended up having to do it here. Um, and there's a little bit going on here because these, these were triamped loudspeakers and trying to indicate how all those things were connecting up. There was just no way around having to um, break some lines and things to do that. But generally speaking, everything is spread way out, way far out, so that everything can be straight lines and everything can work really well. Uh, but that, you know, this is this is a pretty complicated drawing. But you, hopefully, you can see how the, those basic blocks are being utilized to draw this thing out. Any questions so far? Um, for situations when you would use, uh, like, uh, you you would connect two computers wirelessly, mm -hmm. what would be sort of the best way to do that? I mean, would you just say Ethernet out of your one computer into like a time? Um, um, yeah, I mean, you could almost treat it like the same way you would do the wireless mic, and that there's a wireless signal there if you really if that was important to you. I think ultimately, um, if you're doing a, a control network like that that involves wireless, I would probably want to do that as a separate drawing to show how the whole control network is happening, so how everything connects up, because there's probably other things that are also going to connect into that. If that's if that's the only thing you're networking is one computer to another, then it's probably you know, it's wireless. It may not be. There's nothing to diagram really, uh, so I wouldn't stress too much about it. What are the circles? <clears throat> the circles. Oh. Yeah, so this is this is your way around having to do the fanned out line. So if you want to indicate a snake, like an actual bundled snake cable, this is the way you could do it uh, without having to merge the lines physically on the drawing. Is you can draw this little circle around it. And that little circle would, you know, symbolize the jacket of the snake. You know, that bundles this all together. And that seems to be much clearer than, you know, doing that fan out thing. Other questions? Okay, so let me show you. Do you guys know how to get onto the Walrus server that we run? Okay, so uh, you're going to go, you can say go and connect to server, which is command K if you want to. And you're going to type uh, AFP colon slash slash, and you could probably just type walrus. Uh, dot dp sound dot lab and you'd probably get it but the IP address is 10.21.10.3 either way it'll get you in there and when you hit connect it'll ask you for a name and password um, and you would use whatever account I gave you for the sound lab if you don't know that um, you can always usually get in with just a simple sound sound username and password that'll usually get you in as well and then it'll bring up this list. These are all the different shares. You want to go to the Show Archives share folder. And that pulls up over, let's see, here. And there's a folder here called Paperwork Guidelines. And then there's the USITT Diagram Guidelines. And there's two things in here. One is the PDF that I showed you. The other is an actual CAD file of that. So it's that PDF document, but in CAD format. What's that uh, path again? Uh, so from the show archives, there's a folder called Paperwork Guidelines, and then USITT Diagram Guidelines. Um, and you would want to just copy that to your computer. Don't open it from the server there. Uh, however, let's see, once you get there, just copy it for fun here. It's already there. Um, you know, now you could open this up in CAD. And this is certainly what I do when I'm doing diagrams. Uh, I don't draw the blocks <laughs> from scratch. You can if you want to. They're not that complicated to draw. But, um, I would just say if you are gonna if you are gonna just use this diagram that you would probably want to indicate that in your title block somewhere that your blocks came from the, the 
USITC diagram document. Um, so let's see, if we go over to model space, here it is. So I, the only reason I have this is because I was on the, the committee that, that developed this thing, so I have access to the CAD file. But uh, here's everything, including some stuff that never made it into the, it's just other ideas that they, Jonathan Darling was kicking around. Um, for example, really big multi-channel amplifiers and stuff like that. Um, but we never ended up really putting any of that in. Uh, so let's see. Here is the device block, for example. So I could just copy that. And you know, go into a new drawing. New drawing. Hmm. It's behaving very strangely to me. I don't want to do a project. I'll tell you what, I'll do this. I'll save this as a separate file. So I'll just do a sample. There we go. So I could then take this and just go down here and start something something new. Uh, so maybe I'll go get a microphone over here. For what? Like pan. Um, I do it with trackpad. Oh. Oh. With three fingers. Oh. Or no, two fingers pan. In max, two fingers pans. Oh. Um, and then you can pinch and zoom to. Oh my that's, in the, that's in the Mac version. Oops, I made two. Let me do that again. The things you won't learn in your CAD class from Bill. All right, let's try this again. So you can have polar tracking on with the. There we go. All right, so here we go. Tack that on there. There you go. I got a microphone going in. Okay, so on and so forth, right? You could just start drawing out this diagram and making it, okay? So uh, your assignment is to diagram the system that we have set up in the Catawba Theater. You have a week to do it. So that would be between now and Thursday, next Thursday. Yeah? Yeah, I'll take you up there right now. I'll, I'll show you show you around, and then uh, and then you know over the week you can go over there. I mean, it's usually open. Just go up there and take a look and figure out how to draw it. I'm not going to show you a drawing of it. I want you to diagram it. Figure out how that thing works <laughs> and <laughs> draw a diagram of it. Okay. So uh, let me stop the video here, and then we can go take a look at that.